good evening, and thank you for attending tonight's presentation. The Emmy Award-winning journalist, talk show host, and author, Dr. Janice Adams, is this year's University of Finley Woodwill Wilson Visiting Fellow. Her public presentation is entitled, How, Why Is It So Hard to Speak of Race? Dr. Adams is founder and publisher of Backpacks, Packs, which is a history-based adventure series of books, audios, and board games for children. A Northern School desegregation pioneer at eight, she was one of four children selected to break New York's de facto school segregation in the wake of Brown versus Board of Education. A lifelong human rights activist, Dr. Adams launched Backpacks when negative images of race and gender began to taint her twin daughter's lives. In 1990, she founded Harambe, the first national book club for African American literature. Her work has been licensed by McDonald's and underwritten by the Ford Foundation and the Annie E. Casey Foundation, among others. Dr. Adams is the co-executive producer and host of The Janice Adams Show, a weekly public radio program about race and courage. She has also served as NPR's first national arts correspondent and is a pioneer of issue-oriented African American and women programming. A founding board member of Amistad America Incorporated and Women's Media Center, she is a volunteer of mentor editor for the OEP ED project and serves to increase the range of voices and the quality of ideas and the public debate. A classic pianoist, she graduated from New York High School of Performing Arts. She earned a bachelor's degree in theater from New York State University of New York, New Palats, a master in black studies from Mills College, is, and is all but dissertation in history and black studies from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. She holds honorary degrees from Shaw University and State University of New York, New Paltz. Please welcome Dr. Janice Adams. When I, write, when I write, I write from a point of healing because I, like everybody out here, has a pain, has an ache that needs to be addressed. For me, it is it's the obvious. It's the, it's the burden that other people with a racial problem choose to project on me. It's the burden that other people with a gender problem choose to protect, project on me. I don't have a problem with being a woman. I don't have a problem with being a black person. I don't have a problem with any of it. But other people have problems that they choose to project on me. And so I write and I speak from a point where of recognition and validation for what I, symbolic of millions, am feeling. And I write and speak from a point where we can heal ourselves. We can realize that this trash that is coming out of people's mouths has nothing to do with us and everything to do with them. We can. I refer to being a child and because Dr. Ch uh, King literally raised my chin um, saying that I was raised by Dr. King, I, uh, meaning that, that what he was saying was keep your chin up. He w in saying that he thought I was pretty, he was saying if you keep your chin up, all of us, Others can see the beauty that's within us. And so I write and I speak 
to, to promise to him that I will do that and to encourage others to do that, to be beautiful in themselves and to keep their chins up no matter what is going on around us. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking down the freedom trail. Ain't gonna let homophobia Turn me round, sexism, turn me round. Ain't gonna let Islamophobia turn me round. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking down the freedom trail. Ain't gonna let sexism turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let ageism turn me round. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking down the freedom trail. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abels, for that introduction. Thank you to the Findlay University and Woodrow Wilson CIC Visiting Fellows Events Teams for honoring me with the invitation to address your community. Thank you all for welcoming me into the Findlay fold. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you this evening. Why is it so hard to speak about race? Truth be told, I don't know. <laughs> All my life, in word, thought, lack of thought, action, inaction, shouts, chants, taunts, sneers, jibes, and lest I forget in all manner of deeds joyous and affirming, people around me have spoken of nothing but race, meaning racism. Gender and sexism, too. So why do some people find it so hard to speak about race? I turned to others for answers. Because we're afraid to say the wrong thing, say some. Because we're afraid to expose ourselves to criticism and ridicule, say others. Because race speaks volumes about us we don't want to hear. Race makes us feel important, says, say some. Race makes us feel insignificant, say others. Race is painful, race is denial. Race raises some up by putting others down. Race is science, but some don't want to believe it. Race is lies, but some don't want to believe it. Race, racism is the story of America. Race, racism, that's not who we are. Race is an uncomfortable conversation I'd rather not indulge, said one person. If we stop talking about it, the problem will never end, said someone else. Race, racism is like a drug. You keep wanting more, more, more for those it benefits. Because we as Americans are acculturated to think, act, and accept racism as a way of life, so ubiquitous, so ubiquitous that it goes unquestioned. And then the other questions. Who should talk about race? Whose job is it to figure out the race problem? Whose job is it not? Why do we need to talk about race? Because not talking about it isn't doing you any good even if you mistakenly think it is. How many generations, centuries must we exist in racial conflict? How long is 400 years not enough? Must Americans defend the indefensible? 
OMG, why is it so hard to speak of race? And where do we go from here? A journey from history to healing and hope. Part one, history. Come, come. Let me tell you a story my gran I would hear my grandmother called when I seemed in need of soothing. Each story, no matter its filigree, would have the same moral, the same reason for being, to share her philosophy of life. Come, 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 let me tell you a story, a story of the history, the history that has brought us together this day. 58 years, five months, and 26 days ago, I was on a bus headed to the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Just the day before, my aunt had put the finishing touches on a pink and white gingham sundress, albeit a sophisticated one, specially made for that momentous day. With it was a matching scarf I'd tie over a twist of braids as long and thick as questions of race. My mom and I left our home in the Bronx at 3 a.m. for the drive to Harlem where we parked our car, then boarded a chartered bus for D.C. that Wednesday morning. An organizer welcomed us, inducting us for the trip ahead. It would be a day, he said, from which there would be no turning back. And with hours, within hours, I knew why my parents had always resisted venturing south by car or bus. Traveling by train, we'd sped past the blood-soaked soil of the northern south, Maryland and Delaware, past signs colored and white, past trees sagged low by the strange fruit of the lynched. By train, we'd bypass the pain for the promises Washington's architecture evokes, monuments to American freedoms built by Africans enslaved. A northern school desegregation pioneer at eight, that was not my first bout with racism, but that bus ride south was my first time violently denied a restroom or food we could afford to buy. It was my first time to be stormed by screaming white hordes as sheriff's deputies stood idly by. We on the bus were outside agitators disrupting their way of life. The screamers were Americans, citizens, defending their rights. We, said they, were troublemakers. It was 1963. The freedom rides were current events then, not history. Those who attacked our bus on that Delaware-Maryland border, that infamous Mason-Dixon line rocking it from side to side, intended no lullaby. Lumbering into Washington, just before 11, our bus emerged from the raging flames of hatred, underscoring the need for the march, into a swarm, into the swarm of a cheering throng. So embraced, we in turn welcomed the next bus. They then cheered the group after them, and so and on and on. How we got over, the hymn is sung. My soul looks back in wonder how we got over. Journeying from up south or down north, we traveled a treacherous route, fought the same demons and fears, and somehow we'd made it through. We'd made our way out of no way, as black folks say. School desegregation had been a lonely affair, just one of four little foot soldiers for justice against an army of unapologetic evil I'd been. But getting off that bus in Washington, I came to a mighty awakening. I was not alone. We were not alone. By bus, by train, by plane, people of every hue kept coming that day. Some on foot walked hundreds of miles to get to that day. For hours, speakers and singers, drum majors all, kept a steady beat until the time finally came for Dr. King to ascend the podium. 
His familiar baritone tuned like none other, he soothed us, rallied us, regaled us, commended us to heights untold. And when he raised his hand out over the crowd, invoking his dream, I felt myself levitate, soar. One among 250,000 united, I understood the movement and this country as never before. I'd begun the day an innocent in braids and a brand new sundress of pink and white. I would never wear that dress again, nor my hair in those braids. Little wonder FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called Nobel Peace Prize winner Nobel Peace Prize laureate Dr. King, the most dangerous man in America. We were all dangerous that day. It was dangerous to threaten and force doctrines of white supremacy, dangerous to meet the demon face to face, yet keep on keeping on our chartered route. That was the promise and the premise of the civil rights movement. It wasn't about heroes and who got to lead. A good leader must be a good listener, a good follower, a caring friend. Even Dr. King couldn't always be Dr. King. Sometimes he just had to be Martin or Mike. But for every man, woman, and child of conscience and courage who wanted to participate, there was a place for them. If you couldn't be on the front lines being beaten for whatever someone else thought of, then maybe you were the one who could go bandage them up. If you couldn't be the one who was bandaging them up, maybe you could be the one who prepared the lunches. If you couldn't be the one who prepared the lunches, maybe you were the one who watched the kids so someone else could prepare the lunches. Whatever you had to give, there was a place for you. That's why we were dangerous, because we did not waste people's lives. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, we sang. Keep on a-walking, keep on a-talking, walking up the freedom trail. Keep doing the impossible, the necessary. Keep making that way out of no way. That was the mantra of the movement so relevant today. But what I couldn't have imagined 57,588 days ago is how much and how little would change despite 57,888 days of opportunity. The stereotypical sadistic Southern sheriffs then, the Northern peace killings police killings and brutality of innocence today. The screamers who rocked our buses then, the Take Back America madmen of Charlottesville and January 6th today. The sickness that murdered and maimed 14-year-old Emmett Till and exonerated his murderers then, the murders, the murders of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Casey Goodson, Andre Hill, Elijah McClain, Alton Sterling, Breonna Taylor, and on and on, and too, too many more. The voting rights we march for then, the scam recounts, voter ID ruse, and gerrymandering siege against voting rights now. Still, today, I remember Dr. King, the dream, and the vow he made that March on Washington Day. We will not be satisfied, he said, until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. My grandfather took his daughters to march against lynching. My mother took me to the march on Washington. My daughter took my granddaughter to march for Trayvon. Last year, I linked arms with my daughters and granddaughters in spirit to march against the state-sponsored, state-sanctioned police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. The seven shots pumped into the back of Jacob Blake and as his children looked on from the family car. 
we further protested the hypocrisy of a system that, in contrast, allowed the exoneration of an assault rifle wielding white 17 year old vigilante, Kyle Rittenhouse, who violated gun laws in two states to admittedly kill two and wound another in response to protests over unrelenting police murders of innocents. Innocent until proven guilty and innocent. And the lack of accountability for police terror. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. That was the power and the passion poured into me and tended for the journey. As people of conscience, we take our children where we must indeed. So nurtured, fortified by the dream and the vow, we tend trickling waters in preparation for the stream. So yes, when I write or speak about such things as these, I'm always asked to offer a message of hope. I'm often, however, reluctant, not because I don't believe in hope, who doesn't need hope? But because the ask skips a step. What some really want is a first class ticket on an express train to hope, bypassing stations of conscious thought, self-awareness, responsibility, moral imperative, and the participatory demands of what is truly required of a citizen. My job is not to make excuses for my country, nor to offer revisionist denials of culpability. It's to help us, each of us in our own way, and collectively get past our past through healing. It's to give us the fuel we need to confront the uncomfortable, to own what is happening around us, confront it, atone for it, heal from it, grow through it, so we can all move on. Part two, healing. Come, come, come let let me tell you a story I would hear my grandmother call when I seemed in need. Come, come, come let me tell you a story. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. When I became a woman, I put away childish things. As a child hearing the story of Jonah and the whale, I didn't believe it. Then, as a woman watching stunned, as 33 miners swallowed into the belly of the earth were raised up, returned to life whole after 69 days, I realized I had to rethink such things. It's 2010. In witness, the image of 33 men and their six rescuers is beamed from three miles inside the mine's entrance, 2,300 feet below hallowed Chilean ground, to a satellite circling the globe in outer space through a dish of steel into awestruck sights the world over and my own TV in New York putting away childish beliefs, suspending doubt on the judgment of whales, seemed a small price to pay. Now the story as told had always been about being swallowed whole and held captive in the belly of a beast. But how might the story be told from the whale's point of view? Maybe it wasn't the belly of the beast that Jonah went into, and maybe we should start not demeaning whale beings as beasts in the first place. Maybe the whale was a she. Did you ever think of that? Perhaps as Ms. Whale saw it, one day she was out minding her own business, swimming around, out doing her sea chores, when she came upon a drowning man. Not wanting to see him suffer, she brought him into her womb, nurtured him as she would her own, and then when he seemed ready, she returned him to the surface, rebirthing him into new life. Then, just as I was having this revelation about Miss Whale, news came of another group of miners. This other group was in China. They too were trapped by a cave-in, Tragically, on the other hand, 
most were killed by the disaster. So why, as a journalist, a scholar of women's studies of African American history, heritage, and hope, do I tell the story of the miners? Because it occurs to me that there's a lesson here. We cannot always escape life's disasters, but given the opportunity, given the choice, will we see ourselves as trapped in the belly of the beast or emerge whole, reborn to a new life? Like so many of our greatest heroes and sheroes, the miners were the poor men. Who else would risk their lives and lungs going down into such mines day after day? They were humble men existing on the humblest of barley loaves. They had nothing or nearly nothing. A few crusts of bread, the most modest of foods, cans of tuna, shared, shared a, teaspoonful, a teaspoonful at a time. That's what saved 33 men from starvation. 17 days passed before a note taped to the bit of a drilling rig surfaced. Written in Spanish, it read, we are well in the shelter, the 33 of us. Food and water were sent in. It took 69 days to get them out. How did it happen? Their family stood watch, bundled and determined in the coal. The force of the Chilean, Chilean government was joined by an international assemblage of three drilling rigs, a dozen corporations, the US Space Agency, NASA, a specially built rescue capsule, and the wavering vigil via satellite of an, and the unwavering vi vigil via satellite of an estimated 5.3 million people worldwide. That was the miracle of it. But how did the men themselves survive? It would, I think, be too easy to say they were saved by their faith. Who each man was as a person, his beliefs, yes, his attitude toward life, his culture, worldview, his belief in himself, and when that failed, his commitment to the other 32 men, all of that factored in. They found the key to their survival in unity in their strength and dignity, in their ability to draw on talents most did not know they had. With limited possibilities for their survival, their sights and insights adjusted to the gloom. They made a way out of no way for themselves. From their experience, a fable was born, a parable of two miners and a white butterfly. One day, a day like most others, two miners entered a mine. They heard a few cracking sounds as they began their shift, but intent on setting about their work, they made their way underground. As they did so, they saw what looked like a butterfly float by. Now, a butterfly in a mine is a rare sight indeed. So the men paused for a moment to admire nature's wonder and beauty, to behold life's infinite capacity for surprise. And then it happened. Defying their expectation of just another day, the mind began to rumble. Dust clouds filled the air. Their world collapsed in front of them. Had the men not taken that moment for wonder, they would have been crushed by the rocks that just then caved in directly in front of them. For all of us today, in these difficult times, in a world shut down and scuttled by forces none of us quite understand, do we really expect that some simplistic gibberish about our freedoms will save millions of people from dying? Do we really believe that that just saying these words is what it will take to get us out of the current situation we're in? Or will we take time for wonder, take time to understand all that it has taken for each of us to live 
That's the macro of the story. Here's the micro, which for each of us as individuals is our own personal macro. That's what I want to talk to you about this evening. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. We sang in those days of the civil rights movement, America's human rights movement in the midst of the most egregious human rights violations. And so in the midst of all this and what we're going through today, yes indeed, why is it so hard to talk about race? Because we're talking about race instead of ourselves. Each of us must come to the decision of who we want to be. What do we want our lives to stand for, not against, but for. No matter the catastrophes, the calamities, the politics, the perversion, the excuses, the confusion, the lack of information, lack of inspiration, lack of perspiration, and the failure of imagination. Who's will, who, some will say, are you to think you can do things others say is impossible, are impossible? And I ask, who are you to think you can't? Part three, hope. Come, come, come let me tell you this final part of the story. When I write or speak about such things as these, the question isn't what will I say, it's what must I do? I'm always asked, as I said, to offer a, men a message of hope. And yes, I'm reluctant because it is in itself something that is missing. And so what I look for here, as I said before, is it's to give us all fuel, the fuel we need to confront the uncomfortable, to own what is happening around us. Throughout the Caribbean, possibly other regions too, there are traditional ring games where a ring or circle is formed. As the players chant a rhyme and clap in time, someone is called into the ring, never knowing who will be next. One such game says, come in and show your motion. Whatever you can do is your contribution to the game, is showing your motion. A casual observer watching the center player might miss the role of the ring. It's to keep the ring whole and to cheer each other on. Just one among all the mothers, fathers, families, friends, caring fellow human beings, none of us knows when or how life will call us into the circle or which circle, whose circle. We do know, however, that we will all be called upon to make our way out of no way. We must be mindful of things otherwise taken for granted. Over the years, these are some of the things I've had to remind myself of. Number one, watch my language. Be careful of words when words like black and white, of words like black and white, when black is consistently used to depict all things negative, and white is used to consistently connote purity and innocence. Beware that our language has embedded within it codes designed to otherize, codes of oppression. Rethink how words mask truths. Despite phrases like the importation of slaves, you don't import people. And yet we've all been taught about the importation of slaves during the transatlantic slave trade. People are not cheese or olive oil. Africans were kidnapped. The American slave trade was human trafficking. African Americans were not born slaves. They were enslaved at birth. Enslaved people and their descendants are not commodities, inanimate things, objects, nothing. We are people. 
We are as you yourself want to be known. We are all in this room someone's child. Reject denial. The issue isn't imposing. So often when, when people speak about 18th century life for the founders, you know, they say, well, you're imposing 21st century um, thought on the 18th century. And I say, no. What 21st century people are demanding is that we remember that while some 18th century people believed in enslaving others, other 18th century people, notably those enslaved, did not. Denying their rights then does not entitle us to continue to do so now. That's the thing. Reject policies enacted in the name of religion to cover up the trampling of fundamental human rights. There is not a respected, recognized religion in the world that does not have at its core do unto others as you would have them do unto you, period. That's really all you need. Hold police accountable by holding us all accountable for how we raise, train, and hire police officers. Training does not stop police brutality, but screening our people with pre-existing racist tendencies does. Hold politicians accountable for being responsible. The ill-gotten gain of winning elections by suppressing the vote is what led to and maintained the 246-year reign of terror called slavery and 150 years of segregation. At some point, it has to be the right time to do the right thing. Listen, learn, Respect yourself, respect everyone. Confronting history changed my life. Studying the Underground Railroad and producing my Backpacks Kids book, audio, and board game on the subject changed my perspective on life. Steal Away, Escape to Freedom on the Underground Railroad is not the first game I've produced for children or adults. But uniquely, each of my games is cooperative, not competitive. Competition is great if all you want to do is say, yay, I won. But it won't get you where you need to go as a person. That takes cooperation. And where do we need to go? For me, in the spirit of the Underground Railroad, one of our most profound historical episodes, I used that training to help me free others along my route. I tell them what I've come to know. We have been demeaned as black people. We have been demeaned as slaves as though the shame of those who would enslave us could take the measure of our lives. We have been segregated as less than, as though the blindness of those who would mock us could share the vision of all we survey. We have known the depths of despair, yet we lift ourselves up through the legacy of our past and the promise of our future. O oh, ye sons and daughters of Africa, congratulations. O oh, ye sons and daughters of the indigenous nations, of South and Latin America, of Asia, of Europe, of every race, ability, gender, identity, faith, and imagination, congratulations. Do you truly understand what a mighty people we are? What a mighty people you are. This little light of mine, I think to myself, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine I share with you, and we must each say to ourselves, we're going to let it shine. That's where we lose our vulnerability to intolerance. That's where we gain the 
sense of self that will not allow us to participate in that. That's how we speak about race. And so I ask you to sing it with me because it's important. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. You and me, this little light of mine, we're going to let it shine. This little light of mine, yes, we're going to let it shine. This little light of mine, we're going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All over the world, all over the world, we're going to let it shine. All over the world, we're going to let it shine. All over the world, we're going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I thank you. Thank you so much. I don't want to leave without opening the floor to questions. If there are any comments, if you have some, whatever you'd like to share, please do so. There's a mic over here. Um, anybody? Nobody? Um, it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Okay, two part question. First, is, is racism in America, is it American thing? Do, is, do we have, are, is, is there the same kind of racism in other countries as there is in America? I'm and sorry, I truly am having a hard time. Oh, okay. The, I, I I'll take my mask off. So, so my question was, um, is the racism we see in America, is that purely an American type of racism? Is it as systemic as it is here in other countries, do you think? And then secondly, my question, the two part is, why are we going backwards? Because I really do think we are going backwards in our attitudes about racism in this country. It's not getting better. I, I, I don't see it that way. I, I see video of, of the march 58 years ago, and um, I, I just, I still see definitely vestiges of that racism alive and well today. Okay, the first part of my question is, do you think that American racism is its own brand of racism as compared to other countries? Um, and then the second part is, I feel like we're going backwards in many of our attitudes. Feel that we're going backwards in... We are going backwards. I mean, that's what this voters, if you suppress exactly. the vote, you are denying people when, when it's... American history, we talk about no taxation without representation. Yet for some reason, it's all right to suppress the vote so that other people have no representation and are still paying taxes. So
So yes, we are going backwards, and that's the terror of these times, because it, 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 some will say it feels like we're going back to the 50s. I say it really feels like going back to the 1890s, because that is the period of time in which coming out of Reconstruction, I'm sorry, I should be doing this, in which coming out of Reconstruction, um, in 1896, you have the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, which essentially legalizes a reign of terror called segregation. Um, and that is what is happening now. They forced, at, up until the 80s, there were more black elected officials post-Reconstruction than there were in the 20th century, because they had all been pushed out of office. So, and I think it's important that we know these things because otherwise when you hear things that you know just don't sound right, but you don't, you're not grounded in what is really happening and what is done. And I'm going to say it this way, let us not forget that most of our people in Congress are lawyers, but Newt Gingrich was a historian. Newt Gingrich led the charge. I remember the very first day that he was elected um, Speaker of the House, and he's flying down the hallway, you know, excited as he should have been, and everybody's following ask after him, and they say to him, what is the top of your agenda? And the very first thing that comes out of his mouth that day is we have to look at the disproportionate power of the Congressional Black Caucus. And at that point, the Congressional Black Caucus was less than 30 people in a Congress of 535. So that alone, and the implication of that was that 60 minutes, he said that in the spring, 60 minutes when they began to promote what, was, what they were going to lead with that fall for their return of their season, that was the headline. The Congressional Black Caucus and its power. So ginning Americans up on racism is not unfortunately a hard thing to do. I do not compare American racism to racism elsewhere. I don't even equate it uh, for a simple reason. Because when things are going right, we never compare ourselves to anybody else. We always talk about how exceptional we are. But when we're caught, doing this, then we want to suddenly say, well, you know what everybody else does, it's so universal. I mean, this is just human nature. No, it isn't. What happened in the United States is unique. It, and even next to South America, American enslavement, this chattel slavery system that still cannot be shaken, has to be seen for what it is. And it is still a part of the American fabric in ways, don't even begin to talk about what it means to Native Americans. I mean, that's so it, unbelievable that uh, that's such a paltry word, but you know why I'm, I mean, it's just so astounding, it's just such an atrocity that we don't even have words to express. Genocide is, is, is minimal next to what was done to indigenous peoples on this continent. So, that's why I don't analogize it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Anyone else? Please. You might want to. Did you hear that? She asked if you could speak on critical race theory. Critical race theory? <laughs> Um, thank you. Critical race theory. How many people in the room know what it is? I'm going to start there. Okay. Critical race theory is a legal construct. Harvard Law School regularly did critical legal studies 
And Derek Bell, who I actually knew, was a phenomenal civil rights era attorney who put his life on the line to defend demonstrators who were being brutalized at the time and trumped up charges you know, raised against them. Um, and he did that for so many years and was known for it and respected for it. And at a certain point, he was invited to be faculty at Harvard University. And in law school and in that environment where you have critical legal studies, he created this concept of critical race theory. What it is about is simply saying uh, critical legal studies are about looking at law and seeing what the influences are that may have that lead that lead law to and policy to be enacted in certain ways he looked at it because it was not being discussed the impact of race on law was not being discussed and so he created critical race theory in Around 2020, I think it was, um, a Republican operative journalist was sent an email that said in Seattle, Washington, um, there were um, sensitivity training and race training kind of uh, sessions, I'll just call them, that um, the person sending the email was not fond of. Now, this was during the start of the pandemic, and what Zoom had done was that, as opposed to these meetings taking place in person, the meetings were now taking place on Zoom, where you could shoot uh, you could take a copy of it, you could have a copy, you could share the copy. And so, someone forwarded him a copy of this particular session. Um, and he leveraged that for his conservative audience to talk about essentially ginning up how black folks are taking over and they're trying to make you feel bad and this, that, and the other. And it, it's more than that, but that's the sum summary of it. That he then got so much PR for that it ended up on Fox News. And the day after his interview with Tr uh, Tucker Carlson aired, he got a call from the White House saying that Trump would like to speak with him because they had seen it. And then he was asked to go to the White House and help draft an executive order that would ban critical race theory, and we're off to the races. Now, the, I've read some of the um, narrative that was being used for the so-called sensitivity training that the person was objecting to. I didn't particularly think it was appropriate or profound or helpful. But I haven't thought that a whole lot of stuff wasn't important, profound, or helpful. <laughs> you know? I don't think that segregated schools are important, profound, or helpful. But I haven't seen, and this to me is personal, as one of the four children who pioneered northern school desegregation from New York, it's personal that New York is now considered the most segregated state education system in the country. I'm not seeing much on that. We're not seeing much on the George, George Floyd Policing Act. We are not, when we know, and I mentioned it at dinner, and it's, an un, uh, it's, a, it's a heinous statistic, that on average each week, the number of black people killed by police 
innocent people killed by police. Innocent because they really are innocent, and innocent also because you're innocent until proven guilty, supposedly, and innocent because Eric Garner, for example, in New York, who was strangled and jumped by police, was selling some loose cigarettes on the street and for that was given the death penalty, and no police officer has been held accountable for that to this day. On average, the number of black people killed in a week now exceeds the number on average of people lynched per week at the height of segregation. And as opposed to that period where it's so easy to cover and say, well, that was mobs and that, this is being done by an instrument of our government, our police. At the same time that the response to it from certain quarters is to push back and say, you shouldn't have any representation. You shouldn't even have anybody who can argue your case on the national platform for it. So critical race theory is a canard. It is a distraction. It is ignorant. It is manipulative. But it is effective in terms of rallying people who want to be rallied on this score. I don't know what it will take for America to grow beyond this susceptibility. But 400 years, 403 years since the first documented boatload of Africans was kidnapped and forced to these shores. When you say these things take time, I think 403 years should be time enough. How long should it take? How much longer does it need to take? And one of the functions of not talking about race and not talking seriously about this American crisis, this American lack of character, this American um, disease, but, but it's more than a disease because it is something that is not Diseases come through nature and then they spread and then we try to see, using intelligence, what we can do to avoid the disease. This is something that we're using intelligence, misusing intelligence to foster. So I have to give, um, I can't just see it as something accidental like a disease. This is evil. This is greed. This is power gone, power Power hungriness gone power mad, and that's what it is, and it has been for 400 years. And if we deal with the indigenous experience, not just the African-American experience, then we're talking from the 1400s to this point. Critical race theory is also, by the way, the absence of critical thinking as not the actual critical race theory, but the hysteria around critical race theory. And um, that is something that we also have to really think about, the ease with which people are willing to be manipulated. I had someone when, when we were talking about this speech, and someone said to me, well, you know, one of the reasons people don't talk about race is because they're just so busy going to work every day, raising their children, and they just don't have time to think about this. And I know what the person meant, but black people are also busy raising their children, going to work every day, and trying to live their lives, and we have no choice but to think about it. That's one of the problems. That's the problem. Here's Patty. Wow. 
wow, what an amazing and enlightening um, presentation here this evening. Um, the University of Finley, I would like to thank you. Um, so, thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Should I? Just a small token of our appreciation. Oh, let me see. And she will be around, um, Dr. Adams will be around a while yet here for this evening. Um, in case if you do want to talk with her, um, she will we'll be around this evening here yet. And there were, yep, they're still there. There are some refreshments in the back of the room. Um, please help yourself to the refreshments. Oh my goodness. And thank you for attending the presentation here this evening. Oh, yeah. <laughs> gave me an institution here. <laughs> <laughs> Wearing elastic. She loves the ice cream.